I am so glad to be with you, you this morning in the second week in the season of Lent. I, I really love Lent because it is, you know, about six weeks long. So there really is this spaciousness where we can deepen into our own personal spiritual practices and also really get into it as a community in this space. I feel like, you know, with Advent, like, boom, we're done after four weeks and it's gone. But with Lent, we have some time to get through, through Lent with some quiet and contemplation. And every single time I come into a season like this, and also particularly into Lent, I like to hang my hat on something. And so I was thinking about this morning um, or this week. What is that thing that I'm going to hang my hat on? And I thought of the word amen. I thought of the word amen because during this time we often say a lot of prayers. We have some different kinds of rituals, maybe some different practices. And we end that time and we bracket, bracket that moment with amen. And for me, sometimes, even when I'm standing up here at the pulpit preaching or saying a prayer, and then I end with a amen, I'm like, all finished. We're all done. Let's move on. But the word amen in Hebrew doesn't mean all finished. It actually means trustworthy and reliable. Trustworthy and reliable. So I want you to imagine this morning, as we go through our prayers, and maybe this week, when you say your prayers and you end with amen, you think, I am trustworthy and reliable, and God is trustworthy and reliable. Or you're in this community praying with, as a whole community, and you think, Plymouth is trustworthy and reliable. And God is trustworthy and reliable. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Okay, I might do that a couple of times, so I'm going to keep you on your toes. So last week, Brooklyn um, told the scripture, and one of the things she says was that Jesus was getting ready to go into his public ministry for quite some time. And when you go public... There's people that you want to pay attention, and then there's people you don't want to pay attention to you. And so it is this real, it's this time of courage. This like really like you have to muster up all of this courage. It's something you're called to do and you want to do, but it also takes a lot of courage. And I've said this before, so during this time I always wonder, like, did Jesus stop? and pray with himself, and pray with the community, and then say, amen, amen. So today, I also picked the scripture from the Hebrew text because I also think about those wisdoms that Jesus pulled from, those scripture texts that he was reclaiming for his time and place, to help make sense of his world. And so I decided to pick this scripture text. It didn't come from our traditional lectionary, which is basically gives us a list of scriptures to choose from every week. But I chose it from the woman's lectionary. And the imagery and the story just really grounded me this week. Like I really loved the richness of this story of Elijah this prophet who went to this new town and was instructed that a widow would take care of him. A widow would be in relationship with him and he would be in relationship with this widow. And this widow had everything that she needed to take care of this prophet. Now I want you to remind you, and I've said this before, that women in the ancient world even when they were partnered, literally had no rights, but especially ones that didn't have a partner and had a child they needed to take care of. 
So this widow, I can imagine the weightiness on her shoulders, so heavy with grief and sadness. And you probably could tell just by looking at her, she was ostracized to the margins. She didn't have a community that she could rely on. She was scraping by with not even enough food for herself or emotional nourishment for her heart and soul. And yet, she becomes the heroine of this story. Amen? Amen. It's amazing. So I'm going to tell a story, and I know that some of you have a know this story, but I was just so excited that I wanted to, to share it with all of you, even though, so I hope the people that were there and heard some of this, maybe they can get a little bit something different out of it this time around. This past week, there was a group of us that went to an event with Isaac. Isaac is our immigration nonprofit and resource advocacy group here in Fort Collins. And they were having this huge fundraiser. And there was this beautiful, brilliant, generous member of this church that bought a table for Plymouth. And so there were seven or eight of us there. And then there was a smattering of other Plymouth people all over the place. And so it was super cool to be in this space with 350 people celebrating Isaac. And you know, Plymouth for years has done lots of work with Isaac. So for many of you, this is not a new organization. But they brought this uh, speaker, this keynote speaker, Father Greg Boyle. I know, so great, right? I, I see those nodding heads, so, so great. And he got on the streets years ago in Compton and started walking the streets with gang members and started to rehabilitate them through relationship. And then over the years, it has become a $40 million organization because you know it takes a lot to rehabilitate gang members. And there was a couple of things that he said that I really loved. And the first thing that he said was that something like, you know, it's not going to be exact. We must embrace our wounds in order to connect with the other. We must embrace our wounds. That without doing that, we are going to despise the other. We're not going to be able to have that connection. And I don't mean connect from the bottom up. And I don't mean connect from the top down. I literally mean connect across, right with each other. People across bridges, across divides, people in this congregation, in order to really have those deepened relationships with the other. It made total sense to me to show up. And so I thought about this widow, and I thought about Elijah, and I thought, this is the story that's teaching that. She was not really able to connect with anybody else, but Elijah said, I know you are grieving, and I know you have wounds, and you are also worthy, and you also have enough. And we can be in relationship together. So they had a meal, and then Elijah stayed for weeks with this woman. And they had a relationship. And then the other thing that Father G, that's what they called him, which I love, um, said was that in order for healing to happen, there must be communities of kinship and compassion communities of kinship and compassion. Amen? Amen? Amen. So I began to think about the idea of loneliness because we live in such a lonely culture, even in the digital world. Some people say that we are in this 
a loneliness epidemic. And it's not about the function of a community, and it's not about the structure of a community. It is about the quality of connection within that community. The quality of connection within that community. So I want us to think about that for a second. What would that look like? Would it be that we were able to show up and with those wounds embraced? Because I know that we all have it. I know that all of our shoulders are weighty. I know that we are all walking just a little bit hunched over. And it's hard. And there's grief. And we often want to suppress it. We've all fallen down. We've all messed up. We've all been jerks. Things have happened to us that are out of our control. And then we stuff it. We stuff it way down. And we know how we stuff. I don't need to name all the ways of suppressing because we all know those ways. So what would it look like to embrace those things and to show up just like that. So Father G often brings gang members with him to his events. And he told this story of bringing um, Mario and Gary to an event with 600 social workers. And they told their whole story. And it was, you know, trauma and violence. And they were super open about it. And then one social worker stood up and wanted to ask Gary, this tall, gentle black man who was a father of a son's, and said and asked, what advice would you give your child? And he paused. And then he said, I just. And then he paused again. I just don't want him to be like me. And the social worker immediately said, but why? You're amazing and brilliant and beautiful and look how far you've come and the story you're able to tell us and teach us. Your wounds have taught you so much. Why wouldn't you want your child to be like you? Amen? Amen. So I went home and I talked to my young adult children. And I said, when you are lonely, what do you need to hear? What do you need to hear from someone? What would be helpful? And one of them said, well, when the weight of the world is on me, I don't want to feel like the scum of the earth. I want places where I can have conversations where it just doesn't stay at the surface. I want to be able to go deep, Mom. And I want someone to say that I am loved and worthy. And I said, well, your wounds, let's talk about them. They can teach you something, and they're OK. You are worthy. It's OK to have them. We all have them. The widow had them. Her cross was so heavy. And Elijah said, I don't care. Go and make me some bread. You've got this. I am here with you. I have one more story. You know, this past week was, uh, this past month was Valentine's Day. And you know, I've ma been married for 23 years, so Valentine's Day isn't the most exciting day you've ever known in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
But I noticed, and you know, we had, to, we had to celebrate the week before Valentine's Day because Valentine's Day was Ash Wednesday and we have jobs. And um, I know, right? And um, so I noticed for some time now that Roger's wedding ring was looking a little rough around the edges. So I had, in the last couple of years, I had gotten mine, you know, sort of redone and a little bit extra, but that's besides the point. His, his, his was his dad's, and um, he has had it on the entire time. So um, I said, hey, let's take that off, and let's get a little tattoo on our finger, and let's have it represent our three children. So let's get three hearts. I was super excited about this. So we made the appointment at my regular tattoo person, and, um, Roger's never had a tattoo, by the way. For those of you who don't know, I have the, my arm. And um, he agreed. So an hour beforehand, we like struggled to get the ring off. But he got it off, and we went to our place. And then I sat there, and I got three little hearts on my ring finger. And then it was his turn. And the artist went over to look at his finger, and she's like, yeah, no, nope. We can't, we, can't, we can't do this. Because the indent in his finger was so deep <laughs> that, she, that she couldn't, so she's like, let's wait a week. And I was like, great. And so we made an appointment for the next week, only on a Thursday, not on Ash Wednesday. And we went, and we went back, and as we got closer, I'm like, yeah, the ring, the ring finger's not looking great, Roger. It's like a whole moat. Like, that's how, that's how deep it is around the finger. And he's like, yeah, and I'm also thinking, I don't know if I could do three hearts on my fi ring finger, Marta. And I was like, okay. Um, so he was like, but I really love the St. Francis cross. And I don't know if you know anything about it, but it, like, it, it doesn't have a tip, it looks like a T, and it's actually a Greek letter that um, you know, was formed in the ancient world by pagans, and um, the meaning of this cross is life. And per usual, of course, the Christians took it over. And so he's like, I think I want the St. Francis cross. Okay, great. Um, realizing that we weren't gonna be able to get his ring finger done, I was like, I want the St. Francis cross too. If it means life, I love that. And so we went back and we both got our St. Francis little itty bitty crosses right here on our wrist. He couldn't get his finger. I don't know what we're gonna do about the ring. That's a whole nother thing. I just told you that story because it was kind of funny. But um, we, so we got little crosses. But what I realized is I always think of this cross that Jesus is walking towards as this form of capital punishment of his time, right? And then, you know, I often talk about the crosses that we bear that are hard and difficult. But this season, I want you to like draw a baby cross on your wrist. I know I was gonna bring Sharpies um, because that would have been really great. But I want you to consider the cross as a both and. Your griefs, your wounds, your hardships, and this abundance of life. That it is that somewhere in all of that darkness, there is also life. Amen.